like it. So, thank you, everybody. I'm going to give uh, this talk on Nippy Alliance's role in extending our interfaces um, to automotive uh, industry. And I'm really giving this presentation on behalf of uh, Matt Ronning, who is the chair of the automotive subgroup, who wasn't able to be here uh, today. And, you know, as I indicated in the opening plenary, MIPI Alliance specifications have been targeted primarily toward mobile uh, devices, yet have been implemented outside of mobile in areas including wearables, IoT, and automotive. And it's, this isn't a question of MIPI Alliance trying to find a new identity. Um, this is really a, a situation or a case where there are opportunities where MIPI members are leveraging their investments in mobile and extending those investments. Uh, sometimes many organizations uh, try to reinvent themselves, but that's not the case here. We have a long road ahead for mobile and also new opportunities for, um, for automotive. And I indicated earlier that mobile will continue to be MIPI Alliance's primary focus um, while addressing and extending our specifications into the automotive marketplace. MIPI Alliance, we formed an automotive subgroup uh, primarily to really focus attention and focus uh, the fact that automotive cuts across uh, a large majority of our specifications. And so it also has different requirements and, you know, application areas than mobile device. Um, in addition to the automotive subgroup, we've established um, a birds of a feather group that we call basically to take in other uh, inputs from non MIPI members, uh, automotive uh, OEMs, auto OEMs, as well as tier one, tier two suppliers that maybe traditionally have not participated in uh, mobile uh, organizations like MIPI Alliance. And it really is those. Uh, not only MIPI members, but there are a number of non-members, auto OEMs, who are really looking for MIPI Alliance to solve some of the, the problems that they see in implementing some of the autonomous driving systems as well as uh, other uh, types of areas. Um, so we have the automotive uh, subgroup. We kicked off uh, with a face-to-face -face meeting in March. Uh, so we've been at this for about uh, 10 months now. And I, I'm expecting that we're coming to the conclusion of that process where there would be uh, likely the formation of an automotive working group uh, to further focus attention. But the majority of the specification work will continue in camera, in display, in sensor. Uh, where there maybe isn't a home for uh, an automotive specification, then we would move it into uh, the automotive subgroup. The chair of the group is from Sony, Matt Ronning, and I wanted to indicate that the vice chair of the group is uh, Uwe Gutnagel Buchner from Bosch. So there's a, a good, uh, you have a camera center vendor as well as a big automotive supplier uh, who are kind of leading uh, the activity for the alliance. Matt, I've heard him deliver this presentation, so I'll, I'll take some of his, uh, steal some of his uh, phrases, but he kind of views this as a bit of a, a, a perfect storm. There's large changes in the automotive industry. Uh, there are new players. There are government regulations that are starting to be passed. And also consumer preferences for driving uh, and for using cars are changing. Uh, a lot of younger kids and younger adults. Uh, I know when I was younger, the first opportunity that I had to drive a car, I was taking advantage of that. But today, uh, certainly in the U.S. and I imagine maybe elsewhere as well, uh, the kids are not as eager to drive. Uh, they may have other solutions like Uber or Lyft or, or other. And so um, 
other changes, specific changes in the auto industry include uh, fuel economy standards, so new fuel economy, electrification of the car, uh, car connectivity, uh, new original equipment manufacturers, so new car uh, companies that weren't in existence uh, previously, and they're pushing the models uh, for both manufacturing the cars as well as selling the cars. Um, business models that I mentioned, share cars for rent. Uh, you can rent them for an hour or two, or um, you know, use cars as needed. And so that's really having an impact uh, on the automotive industry, uh, as well as the requirements for automotive. Um, and the demand for driver safety systems, including autonomous driving systems, is really coming about very quickly. I, I think, you know, in the past few years, you've seen uh, a number of companies, including Tesla and others, who are really pushing the technology and, and getting some early implementation uh, on the road. And so I think that's spurring development, that's spurring uh, consumer requests for those applications as well. Um, the, the map there is really, um, yeah, obviously the Silicon Valley area in the U.S. Um, I know we're in the sort of Silicon Valley of Taiwan, um, but there are a large number of global uh, auto manufacturers who have established research facilities in the Bay Area. Uh, we will be having a, an automotive subgroup meeting in December, and it will actually be in the Bay Area to take advantage of uh, the location. You'll be able to read this better uh, on your laptop or when you're able to view it, but really it, it's just showing the different uh, fuel economy standards that are being, you know, pushing innovation uh, around the world. So you have the EU moving to uh, 60 miles per gallon uh, in 2021, the U.S. at 56 miles per gallon in 2025, and I know that Taiwan has also established standards for vehicles uh, before actually China had uh, set their standards, and it's a range based on um, engine size. And so governments around the world are really pushing uh, the envelope as it relates to um, fuel economy and really changing the way cars are, are developed, which also kind of leverages the fact that there are new technologies, as I indicated, electric, uh, electrification and other. Um, and the auto OEMs are doing everything that they can to meet those targets. They're not, you know, it's, it's not, an, an, you know, a simple uh, problem. And so, as an example that uh, we've used in the past is, you're replacing side mirrors uh, with cameras and in-car displays. And that could improve the drag on the car. It may not seem like a lot, but one mile per gallon uh, across all vehicles in a particular uh, region or, or around the world is, is very significant. Um, and the interface between the camera and the, and the display as well as the processing is really where MIPI is focused on automotive. Again, this is another sort of chart that you'll need to review uh, on, online, but the basic story here is that while infotainment, I think when we first started looking at it, infotainment was uh, the primary area. Um, but what you'll see is that you know, while infotainment is important, um, there's also focus on price, there's focus on fuel economy, uh, quality, and then safety. So a lot of these factors are coming into being and, and sort of changing the way uh, cars are manufactured and, the, and sort of the focus area for the technology improvements. Safety features including blind spot detection, night vision, driver attention monitoring, forward collision alert, lane departure warning. So as you unravel those applications and sort of you know, understand how that can be solved, that very much sits in MIPI Alliance's environment of camera, vision, sensing, uh, display. And so, again, just telling the story about why MIPI is uh, looking toward that as well as our members. Um, 
the interesting input statement is still there, but I would say that a number of these other factors that I indicated are really driving and, and spurring these developments. So why MIPI for automotive? This isn't aspirational or some, something that we aspire to. It's actually happening today. There are a, a large number of uh, cameras and, and the, uh, displays as well that are going into the vehicle. Um, and the block diagram that you see on this uh, side is really a, a representation of uh, Mobileye and, and now Intel, their view of um, essentially an auto uh, block diagram. And the red area down here lists the, basically identifies the CSI2 interface. And market growth rates are high, so that's driving uh, not only maybe member interest, but other interest in the areas. Um, and the question is really, how do we get MIPI interfaces from mobile into automotive. Uh, obviously, the, the reach is much longer. Power requirements and other are, are very different than in automotive. And so one area that we're very focused on is the length of the channel. So the camera being on the back of the vehicle may need to get to the front or to a computing device that is actually processing the data. Um, it's definitely longer than the, the 0.3 millimeter that we're currently focused on, um, but it may be as much as 8 meters or 15 meters that are also important. So we're looking at ways that we can extend our current uh, physical layer, uh, maybe not to the extreme of 15 meters, but I, I think there are applications that are looking for maybe a 4 meter. Uh, length or slightly longer. So we're kind of looking at all of the different ranges and the requirements across that physical layer. We're, we're definitely not trying to replace current incumbent you know, auto, existing auto networks. There's, there's a lot of technology that's in the car today that's functioning and, and implemented and adopted and, and uh, already in, in practice in, in automotive. Um, what we're really looking to, and, and when we look to develop a specification, we identify the problem. What, what problem are we trying to solve? We're not trying to solve a problem that, you know, maybe a competing solution uh, solves for the market. We're really honing in on what can be standardized and how can MIPI uh, support the, the auto industry as well as our members. Um, and so we're looking at automotive. Uh, that will continue to focus on the, uh, the mobile market, as they indicated. And MIPI, C and DeFi, CSI2, DSI currently are, are fairly short range versus the longer range needed for automotive. So you can envision, and, and a lot of what we're doing today in the automotive subgroup is really looking and, and identifying the requirements. You know, what are we actually trying to solve? As I mentioned previously, there, there's high growth rates. It's certainly, you know, I think the mobile industry is, is significantly larger, obviously, than the auto industry. But there's, there's a market here, for sure, uh, and a high market growth rate uh, as well. And so what's driving the growth? High data rate sensors being added to the vehicle, inclu including surround sensors. So it's not just about cameras. It's radar. It's LIDAR. It's other image sensors as well. So it's combining all of those uh, into uh, data that's being processed within the auto to allow uh, some of the autonomous driving. Um, the CEO of Mobileye gave a presentation at MIT recently and indicated that current cameras are at the 1.3 megapixel range, or XVA. You know, targeting 2020, we're talking about cameras that are 8 megapixel with high dynamic range and require about 12 gigabits of data per second. So significantly advanced camera, uh, not far from where we might be today you know, with some of the mobile requirements. But automotive requirements are evolving. 
And then you look at the numbers of cameras around the car, so the aggregation of camera sensor and the other data sensor really requires a little bit of a different thought in terms of the processing of, of that information. And then another one that's driving the growth rates are uh, some government regulations as well, that all vehicles in North America and Europe uh, are expected to have two forward-looking cameras in 2020. So if you go buy a car today, I think even on the lower-end models, you're seeing uh, cameras being implemented in, in cars. And that gives a little bit of a, a deeper, maybe technical discussion, but I'll, I'll give you a sort of a high-level review because this is really where a lot of the focus within MIPI working groups, uh, in particular the FI working group as well as the automotive subgroup are. Uh, channel length is both a big challenge and an opportunity for MIPI. Uh, you see the, the top uh, topology, topology A, at 15 meters uh, with four inline connectors. And every connector introduces imp impedance discontinuity. Uh, so four connectors equally phased is kind of the worst case uh, solution to try to solve. And that's what we're targeting. Uh, we're also looking at four meters, uh, which I indicated before is kind of the side mirror replacement. Um, two thirds of uh, the auto gigabit interface are less than four meters. So the extreme again is really the 15 meter that we're looking at, but there are ranges along that uh, along that diagram that uh, MIPI will solve as well. Some applications uh, can already use MIPI specifications, uh, though automotive safety will impact designs. Uh, so it is likely that safety requirements need to be assessed and or written into the specifications. So that's one of the, one of the things as well is that with the automotive uh, subgroup and, and to, be, to be formed working group, really bringing together both the mobile engineers as well as the auto engineers. And you could look across your companies, I would imagine, as well, that often there are really two different uh, people, individuals, two different groups. And so that's one of the things that we're kind of bringing together today to ensure that you know, the mobile focus remains, yet we bring in uh, the automotive uh, aspect of it. And we talked about this channel, the cable topology, and the cable length, but also the other factor is cable type. So two cables have been under discussion from the auto industry and are really kind of the focus of our discussion as well. One is coaxial, and the other is uh, SPP, or shielded parallel pair. So those are the two cable types that, that we're looking at. For those who are familiar with uh, you know, auto industry, there are many different uh, standards or requirements, both for safety uh, and other, that are required in order to implement the technology in the car. And so one, one thing to be mindful, mindful of moving from consumer devices to automotive is what kind of changes are there in terms of design and the targeted sem semiconductor solutions? More than 50 differences between consumer and automotive. Uh, some of them are defined, hopefully, you know, when you get your the slides, you'll be able to take a look at that. Um, reliability, uninterrupted supply, security. Safety translates to auto specifications, including ISO 26262. Um, and the design engineers need to start thinking about failure methods and how to prevent them or compensate for them. Other specifications that are known within the uh, automotive industry also are AEC Q100, TF16949, as well as software and industry standards, Mobile Industry Software Reliability Association, or MISRA-C. So there are a lot of differences, uh, but there's also a lot of similarity. And some of the specifications may not require all of these specifications to be uh, defined or accommodated, and actually, What's happening today, we find, is that there are our current specifications for camera display are being implemented in auto, but it's the uh, manufacturers who are really taking the automotive requirements and, and building their product to meet those standards. So it's, it's less about 
nippy today identifying which standards apply, but it, it's getting a lot of attention and certainly bringing uh, NIPI specifications to automotive carries additional responsibility. I showed this slide earlier, but I'll go into a little bit of detail. When we started looking in more detail with focus on automotive, you know, we kind of asked ourselves, what should be the target? Uh, when you talk about automotive, that's a big, a big word. And so we, we broke it down to really uh, these areas that are listed here. Telematics and in-vehicle infotainment, advanced driver assist systems, or ADAS, intelligence transportation system, ITS, autonomous driving, autonomous driving systems, ADS. And I think that's really, a, at least, uh, that's really the most difficult one, I would say. And the one that, if we solve that, it has impacts on the other uh, application areas as well. So ADS is really the, the place where MIPI is, is focusing attention, uh, focusing some of the new spec developments or evolution of our spec. Um, so, you know, we've kind of narrowed down on that over the past year uh, or so. When you talk about autonomous driving systems, there are uh, levels of uh, autonomy. And I think you're starting to see that. Uh, you see this in uh, some of the consumer, the cars that are out on the market today. So essentially, SAE, the Society of Automotive Engineers, uh, based in the US but global, um, have, have really defined five levels for uh, autonomy. Um, Level zero is the current car where you're driving it. Uh, level two is really kind of where the Tesla S uh, car is coming in at a uh, level two. So there's some assistance, but you know, obviously the driver is still there to take control. And level five uh, is fully autonomous and essentially no driver in the car. Um, so obviously our specifications will range uh, and you know many of the products that our specifications go into may be targeted at different levels of, of the autonomy scale. Um, and to implement these systems, there's a bit of a change in, in terms of the computing power, the compute power that's required. A lot of times today, the, the processing may happen at the camera sensor or the image sensor. And when you consolidate uh, multiple cameras, multiple sensors, and aggregate those, there's a need for uh, improved uh, processing power. So you see an example here, it's not to pitch uh, any one particular product, but just to, to give you a flavor that um, there are companies, maybe members, who are really targeting automotive with specific platforms, so pulling computing and other resources together. NVIDIA, one in particular, with eight teraflops of processing power. So the the processing power that's going into automotive is it's almost paling in comparison to you know the typical processing power that may sit on desktop or, or elsewhere. Um, and then, then autonomous driving systems will require process data from potentially 12 video up to 12 video cameras, ultrasonic sensors, as well as radar and lidar. So it's not just about image uh, anymore. It's really about the data. Uh, pulling multiple sources to enable the autonomous driving uh, that people are expecting that can't just be solved through one technology. You're sort of bridging all of these technologies to accomplish that. So what does an autonomous driving system look like? Um, this is a, a bit of a kind of a reasonable block diagram that is changing as the years progress. But you see uh, surround sensors over here, uh, GPS, cameras, radar, LIDAR, ultrasonic. Um, you see the lower data rate or ultrasonic and, of course, GPS for maps. Um, the current systems have a high data rate surround sensors that have pre-processing at the sensor side, so collision avoidance and blind spot detections. And those systems are, are fairly expensive, um, maybe even proprietary approaches to, to those. Um, and, and that likes to describe the fact that autonomous driving was seen to maybe reduce insurance rates. It certainly reduces uh, accidents and, and loss of life. 
Um, but what, what has been found is that there's a bit of a higher cost when you have accidents now to replace the electronic components that are around the car. So often, we, while we may have thought that insurance rates are, you know, may go down, the cost to insure a car because of all the electronics is actually uh, creeping up a little bit just because of the cost, percentage of cost of the components in the car if they get into an accident. There's also a trend to, uh, in the industry to move toward dumb sensors with less processing on the sensor side and then to move to the processing in the supercomputer. So that changes the dynamics of how you move data in the car, and that's, that's certainly something that uh, we're looking at. And you see some examples in terms of image sensors, uh, 10 gigabits link to support, you know, raw 15 uh, at 10 megapixel, 2 megapixel for radar systems. So there's a number of different ways to look at this as well. I'll leave that there. I see some people taking pictures. In terms of current areas of investigation, I listed a few of them or talked about a few of them before. Um, and it's primarily focused on data rates required for automotive camera interfaces. So, you know, implementing a system that will support 12 gigabytes, uh, bit error rate of 10 to the minus 4 bit error rate, channel definition. So, ensuring that the automotive environment is obviously harsher needs to be designed uh, for a harsher environment with EMI and interference noise uh, and channel distortion that maybe aren't seen uh, within mobile devices. Um, capacitively coupled I, uh, interface requirements not typically found in MIPI interfaces. Um, power constraints on the uh, transmission and receiving side. Functional safety requirements and security, latency and synchronization among multiple sensors. And then the cable size, weight, and connector limitations. So if you look at all of these areas kind of converging and, and really kind of making up the area that we're looking at when we're moving forward with uh, defining an extended longer reach uh, physical layer that will implement our various specifications, including camera, display, and sensor. So some final comments. Um, there, there's lots of interesting work to do. Um, I would say that uh, automotive uh, has spurred a lot of interest. There are current members who are bringing new participants, new individuals, new groups who don't typically come to the Alliance meetings. Um, there's a high level of interest, including auto OEMs uh, that are coming to provide requirements, essentially the user requirements to the Alliance. And Right now, really, the, the selection and prioritization of topics, it's, it's always member-driven. So the members define and direct, you know, how we proceed. And it's through the development process, ultimately, that the technology is developed. So I, I encourage you, those who are in the room who are interested in automotive, to really, you know, participate. Uh, you have an opportunity to see where the market is going as well. Um, and, and participate in the development of the specifications. And so we encourage those companies who are interested, uh, have automotive experience, to join in the discussion and contribute to the specifications. So with that, I'd like to uh, thank everybody again, and uh, hopefully this was informative. We're at the early stage of uh, MIPI investigation into automotive, but there's a lot of work that's already been completed, as I indicated, MIPI specifications are already going into automotive, so now how can we leverage that and improve that moving forward? So, thank you. Are there any questions? Okay. Thank you very much again.